Okay. Uh, hello and welcome to session 4A, Archivist Adapt, off-site but still reaching out. This session has been sponsored by Lucidia. I am Brad Houston. I'm a member of the MAC 2021 Program Committee. So before I turn it over to our session presenters, I would like to go over a few logistical details. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing in approximately two weeks. Please use the Zoom Q&A feature to submit your questions. This session does have the chat feature enabled, which you are free to make comments or share relevant information with your colleagues. But do try to direct questions to the Q&A so they're not missed. I would also like to share Max expectations for conduct in this session, which I am sharing right now in the chats. By participating in this session, you agree to engage respectfully with the presenter and other session participants. Any type of harassing or disruptive behavior is prohibited, including, but not limited to, abusive or derogatory comments, slurs, epithets, threats or acts of violence, intimidation, misgendering, or excessive comments not pertinent to the topic at hand. We will be monitoring the chat throughout the webinar, and if anyone engages in harassing or disruptive behavior, that person will be removed. Thank you for following these guidelines. Finally, you are welcome and encouraged to share your conference experiences via social media. I will be adding to the chat the suggested conference hashtags. All right, with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. I'm Rachel Seal. She, hers. Uh, I'm the Outreach Archivist at Iowa State University. We're going to begin our presentation with the land acknowledgments from all of our universities. Iowa State University is located on the ancestral lands and territory of the Bakotse or Iowa Nation. The United States obtained the land from the Nesquaki and Sauk Nations in the Treaty of 1842. We wish to recognize our obligations to this land and to the people who took care of it, as well as to the 17,000 Native people who live in Iowa today. Central Michigan University is located on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, or the people of the Three Fires, and specifically the Saginaw Chippewa tribe. The University of Nebraska is located on the past, present, and future homelands of the Pawnee, Ponca, Odo, Missouri, Omaha, Dakota, Lakota, Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Caw peoples, as well as the relocated Ho-Chunk, Iowa, and Sac and Fox peoples. For those of us joining, for those joining us today from other locations, we urge you to take the necessary time and learn about the land where you currently find yourself and the indigenous peoples who have lived and continue to live on the lands. Uh, you can visit Native Land Digital to learn more. Next, please. So thank you for coming to our presentation. Um, I will let the presenters introduce themselves when they present their pieces. Um, like I said, my name is Rachel Seal. My physical description uh, is I'm a mixed race Filipino woman, 43 years old, medium dark brown hair, black glasses, wearing a turquoise dress, standing with a backdrop. Um, I think I'm on the second floor or the third floor maybe. Um, a view from the inside of Parks Library's main public staircase. I wanted to give a shout out to session 3B yesterday where we learned where I learned to do physical descriptions um, for presentations. Uh, the session was improving archival accessibility and archival spaces. If you didn't have a chance to attend, I really urge you to check it out when the recording's available. So um, so this presentation is about uh, some of our outreach efforts during the pandemic in tough times. Sometimes outreach is, you know, what falls by the wayside. Other higher priorities come to the, you know, forefront. There's fires to put out. And last year there were a lot of fires. Um, outreach is important though, because even in tough times and when you aren't doing all the things you usually do, it reminds your community that you're still there. Um, you may not have been open to the public for parts of last year or all of the year. Um, you may not have had access to your collections. 
But you, we were all still working and trying to serve, even if we had, were under a limited capacity to do so. Uh, many of us are starting to resume our pre-pandemic schedules and practices, but I think we can carry some of the things we've learned this past year into our outreach activities moving forward. Um, and we should have time for questions at the end. So, sorry, I'm, looking, I'm gonna be looking at my notes and the screen. Um, so like I said, I was the outreach archivist. Um, my, main my main responsibility at Iowa State University Special Collections and University Archives, which I will refer to as SCUA for the rest of the session, is outreach. Um, I know everyone has a little bit usually of outreach in their description, along with the many, many other things they have to do, but it's the main part of mine. Um, and this past year, the only event I really was able to do um, was uh, I taught an honor seminar um, and our students did a public final presentations. And I was very pleased with the outcome, though at times I wasn't sure I was making the right choices. So as you can see in the slide, um, I cut and paste this from the honor seminar pages. So the honor seminar at ISU are one to two credit special topic classes offered only to honor students. Enrollment is generally limited to 17 students and these seminars promote a crucial atmosphere of intellectual exchange and a high level of student involvement in learning. They really want hands-on um, things, you know, and all honor students will, you know, take the seminars as part of the requirement to graduate with honors. They're not always freshmen, but I tend to get a lot of freshmen. Anyone can teach these classes. Um, at Iowa State, uh, I'm classified as an academic librarian, but I'm not faculty. Um, they used to have faculty, but they don't anymore. We, the archivists in, in um, Iowa State don't teach uh, credit courses generally. There is an information literacy course that the research librarians do um, and instruction librarians, but we don't do that. So most of our courses are one-shot sessions. Um, and so honor seminar is the only opportunity for us to do a class for you know either half a semester or an entire semester. Um, you know, the one-shot sessions, the instructors want us to you, you know, usually orient their students to our reading room, our policies, you know, you know, the research process, teach them how to do research. Um, it's really hard to do with the limited amount of time we have. We just pretty much break the ice, make them feel comfortable. So when they come in to do research, it's not completely, you know, unfamiliar to them. So in the past, before I came to Iowa State University, um, we, our former department head, school's former head, Tanya Zanish Belcher, she had taught an honor seminar. And you can read all about it in Pastis Portal, Teaching Undergraduates Using Special Collections and Archives, published in 2012. Next, please. Um, oh, next slide, please. Thank you. So this picture here is the, uh, oh no, back to fall 2019, please, Brian. Uh, so this picture here is the final, pres you know, Final presentation for our fall 2019 students. Um, it was the first time we taught the seminar uh, under the direction of our then head, Katrina Jackson, who um, is now at Syracuse University. Uh, we all put together the archivist uh, proposal based on a course she did when she was outreach and instructor, instruction head at University of Virginia. We took the class, tweaked it for our purposes, and there were three of us who taught it. Amy Bishop, the Rare Books and Manuscripts Archivist, and Rachel Atchison, uh, our Assistant University Archivist who focuses on student groups and student records. Um, and I taught the course. We did half a semester, and the mission of the course was to demystify primary source research and develop primary source research skills. Um, we had a whole, or at least eight weeks to do all the things we couldn't do in one class session. We wanted students to understand the past and recognize historical narratives as constructed and also be able to inform and educate their peers and others about the value of archives and cultural heritage institutions as information resources. We also wanted them to recognize and be able to share the stories that primary sources reveal about people, society, and events. Um, we opted for half a semester course. And the, like I said, the final project, which is here, was a group project where students had to put together a mini like pop-up exhibit and then present it at a reception during class time that would be open to the public. This is our the second level in our rotunda. It's the room that has all of the ISU presidents. I don't remember the artist who painted that mural, but another mural up leading up the staircase is a mural by Grant Woods. So it's a really nice room in general for receptions, um, we thought. <laughs> we did not widely publicize the event, um, mostly on campus publicity, even though we encouraged the students to invite you know, friends and family if they were around. You know, parking's not great um, at ISU. It's a great walking campus, but they really restrict 
parking. So it's hard if you're not, if you don't work there or go to school there, you know, to find parking. And we weren't sure how good it would be. Not too, you know, it wasn't the students, you know, it was just, it was the first time we did this. We weren't sure, you know, in class, they were sometimes like not enthusiastic. It was the end of the day. And so we just thought like, gosh, we don't know how good this is gonna be. Let's just kind of do a, you know, a small, a small event. We were really happy with the outcome. Um, although, you know, I think moving forward, we, we thought maybe not this room, the acoustics weren't great. And we tried to have a mic in there, but I, weirdly enough, there was, we couldn't find a plug, any outlets, um, which is really strange for a library room. Uh, we thought better, it would be better too to have a program versus just an open reception where people were wandering around because the students did, you know, do a presentation. So we thought a nice little agenda for the next year would be great. Um, next, please. So we wanted to do the class again. Um, I was the one, I decided to teach it myself this time. So as not to use all our archivist instructors in one course. Um, and also, you know, I'd done it before and it was a little bit easier. Um, I knew what I was doing more. Uh, so this image here is uh, one of our days in class. See how the students are spread out. They, you know, they did research in this, this is our classroom. Usually we fit 24 students in if they're doing group instruction. I think if they were sitting classroom style, it'd be 35. Capacity was 12. Um, so I cut the class to 10 students um, and we they, you know, made sure they could spread out. And we Zoomed in all the classes, even if they were on site, um, because oftentimes, you know, we had guest instructors. This is Amy Bishop's class. I think she was Zooming from home because she was on offsite schedule and I was on site. So this is just one of the classes. Um, the semester. So on our seminar proposals are due the fourth week of the semester before the semester you want to teach it. So I turn in a proposal in early, first week of February 2020. Um, university started sending home employees in March, uh, mostly spring break. We were sent home, our department was sent home March 17th, and we didn't come back to campus until August. Um, you know, at the time, I wasn't sure, I was pretty sure the proposal would be accepted because they, they really liked it the year before, um, the honors program. But I just didn't know, like, what, how, what's going to happen? Are, you know, are we going to even be on campus? So I prepared both, you know, to be on site, but also to be off site. But I just didn't know. Um, at some point, ISU did give us some guidance and they did give us plenty of time. I just don't remember when they let us know. But they kind of gave instructions and guidelines of how instructors could decide whether to teach remotely or be on campus. And they were like, this is how much space you need. You know, they, they really laid it out. And I opted to do a hybrid class that matched my hybrid work schedule. Our department um, split in half, and we've been working. One team works on site, and the other team works off site, and we alternate. Um, we've been doing that since August of last year, and we're finally integrating in June, so that's exciting. But anyhow, I was really nervous. I was kind of scared to teach in person, um, but we were spaced out, and I could, you know, I could ask the students to wear masks, and I made a really flexible absentee policy. So. Um, if they weren't feeling good, if they had to quarantine, they could just zoom in, the classes were being recorded, they could make up, and everyone, attendance was great, and everyone was really respectful, and um, it was a good year. So anyhow, um, like I said, I, I had lined up my guest speakers, uh, mostly my colleagues, Rachel Atchison and Amy Bishop from last, my former co-instructors, and Greg Bailey, university archivist, were my guest instructors, and also a filmmaker who researches in our collections, and he did a, he, he was a guest instructor the year before, or guest lecturer the year before. Um, we use a lot of the same readings, including podcasts and YouTube clips. Um, we really uh, wanted, uh, so the difference this year is obviously, you know, we use digital collections, which the first year we did not. Um, you know, there was just no way with the amount of time they were gonna be on campus that they would be able to, you know, have that time in the reading room looking at our collection. So, um, they had a digital component, um, not just our collections. I opened it up to Digital Public Library of America and Library of Congress. I wanted to give some parameters um, so that, you know, there's a lot of digital collections online. Uh, the mission of the course was the same as the first year. And just like before, although I'm not sure I mentioned it, we wanted students to consider narratives other than the dominant narratives um, so they could see how that impacted the historical, you know, narratives or the history they've been taught, we'd all been taught. Um, and to also hopefully think critically about you know the material they had. Uh, oftentimes our, our collections don't have the materials um, that represent uh, underrepresented, underserved communities. Um, you know, ISC is a primarily white institution. Um, so expanding it to digital collections outside of ours was really helpful. 
it was a you know larger scope. Um, and the students were able to see a larger range of what, what could, could be in an archives and not just what SCUA had. Um, we did first class, first part of the class was a lecture and the second part was a lab. The lab was, you know, in the reading room or when we were remote, they would, um, you know, be looking at digital collections and have kind of, um, we'd take some time like, oh, go look at this and come back in 20 minutes and we'll talk about it. Um, I did let them out early on the remote days and I don't think anyone complained. It was just really hard to, you um, sustain energy and even though I had lesson plans, you know, no surprise, student engagement was really hard in the remote sessions. Um, I didn't make them turn their cameras on because it seemed invasive and I would rather the struggle be on my end than on their end. I was aware that they would probably had more camera time all day than I did. Um, I mean, I had meetings, but you know, they have to go to school and they have to, you know, do projects and, you know, probably many of them work. Um, so, uh, the only time I asked them to keep their cameras on was for final presentations. They did engage, you know, they would unmute or they would use chat a lot, uh, which I encouraged. Um, and in the evaluations at the end of the class, they did prefer the on-site days and suggested having the class, um, instead of having class one, two hour class a week to do the lecture earlier in the week and then the lab later in the week. Um, so next please. So we, the library is super lucky. Uh, this is a shot of our um, portions of our invitation that we sent out to everyone. The library is super lucky to have a communication team that not only publicizes events, but it also works on a communication strategy with you. I've collaborated with them many times and I really appreciate their work. Um, my colleague on the communication team, um, Monica Gillen, she had suggested when we were putting together promotion materials that we treat this like a mini conference. So what I thought was brilliant. Um, so when we promoted the events, we asked the students to give us, you know, selfies or whatever, and, and they were okay. They were totally okay doing this. I, I told them they didn't have to. Um, they they had like professional headshots and senior portraits. It was great. Um, and then we included, you know, their year, their major, their college, and the working title of their presentation, because of course they did not have the final titles ready by the time, you know, communication needed to send this material out. Um, the students love the idea, and I was really excited to have such a polished publicity effort um, about, you know, for this event. And the colleges seemed, you know, excited too. And we also, you know, advertised that we were going to record the event because you can, and the students agree. You know, I checked with them, of course, too. And we thought it was going to be good to record it, and we could put it on. Uh, we, I really hadn't thought that far, honestly. I thought we'll put a copy in the DR and like promote it on our blog posts. Um, or the, you know, the DRs being our digital repository. Okay, so next slide, please. So final presentations, the class, like I said, um, I was stressed to teach in person, but really it was after the first day, it was fine. It was great. Um, and we did it the whole semester instead of half a semester. Um, we had, it was just a good experience, but Final presentations was the most stressful part of the class for me. Um, the students seemed to enjoy it and they really rose to the occasion and, and I was really happy about that. But they were turning stuff in so late. I was sweating the day of the presentation. Um, you know, I had us come meet earlier and, and all of them except for one student had, per my suggestion, recorded their presentations. And then we were gonna, and I had uploaded them and I was just gonna stream them all just to make it more seamless. Um, and one student may have the option of doing it live. She decided to do a, a live uh, presentation. Their presentations, I don't know if I mentioned it, could be, you know, typical slideshow presentations, essays, blog posts, or I suggested they, I really pushed for a creative project, something creative inspired by archival uh, materials. Um, and some of them did creative projects and it was great. But anyhow, they were turning stuff in last minute. I had, I had projects due the week before so I could get everything ready. And of course, less than half of them turn it in on time. And they were just dropping stuff in. The person who was going live after I had already uploaded her presentation, my computer was like, oh, I made changes. And I was like, we're going live in 15 minutes. Um, but we got it all together. And then uh, and then we go on and we, I had hired a, a captioner. And, um, but of course we had technical difficulties. Of course we did. We used WebEx um, and I had rehearsed with a live captioner and the students and I had rehearsed, but we didn't rehearse together because of scheduling. So somehow, and I can't remember the details, 
But if you really want to know, you can email me and I'll look up to see what went wrong. But the way the captioner had set up to do the captions on WebEx was in conflict with something that I needed from WebEx. I don't remember because like I needed the chat or I needed, um, but it was it was funky. And so she had to do a, she had to do some tweaking on the fly when we were already live and had guests. Um, it really didn't take that long, but it felt like it took forever. Um, but then we got going and it was fine. And then everything went smoothly, I thought. Um, and then, so I went to look at the recording afterwards and every recorded presentation, which was all of them except for one, did not get captured in the recording because maybe some of you know this, but uh, MP, so you have different options on WebEx um, when you um, share uh, your screen, share material. And the only option, and I can't remember which one it is now, but the only option that allowed for sound was this one option. However, that option was not support, like MP4 was not supported file type for WebEx events. So when I watched the recording, it was me doing the live intro and then just white screen, like technical difficulties kind of a thing, silence, one live presentation, then silence, silence, silence for like 45, you know, almost an hour. And then the live Q and A at the end. And I was so bummed out, but I thought, oh, well, you know, it'll just be messy, but I have all the students pre-recordings and I have the one live one and we'll just put it together and let people, you know, I'll note in the metadata record at what point their presentation was supposed to be in the presentation. You know, like it was just gonna be messy. And I was really bummed because colleges, people who had missed it were like, when is it gonna be up? And so I was like, ugh, never. But, um, but the captioner introduced me to someone who worked at uh, our university in, in collaborative technology services because she did the live captions and then she gave me the caption file, but I did not know how to marry the two together for when I wanted to put it in our digital repository. And at the end, I put it in YouTube and did the captions there too. But he, so she's like, oh, this is who I usually use. So I contacted him and he was working on it and he did it with, you know, and then he mentioned like, you know, for your pre the presentation video, like there's all this blank space. And I, and I told him what happened and he said, I can edit that. I, if you give me access to the recordings, I can just drop them in where they need to go. And so he did, and he did it for free, even though I think usually he would charge because he said it was a professional development opportunity for him because he never had to do that before. And then he let me know his department was available to assist with virtual events, which was awesome and something I'm gonna definitely keep in mind for the future. And then I also realized too late, um, like I, I knew about it before the presentation, but I just didn't have time to hire him. You know, the library hires a host to run their events. So I could have done that because the honors program, they give each, they, the instructors have opportunities to ask for a stipend and they usually give it to you. Um, I've always gotten the money and just, and, and spent it on, you know, catering the first year and the second year, I was like, I'll buy education books. Um, and, 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 but I did, you know, and I paid for the captioner, but I had plenty of money left over. I could have paid for a host, you know, I could have paid for the cloud of technology services to help us. And I, I know not everyone works at a place where they have so many um, such support, but I do, and I should have looked and I just didn't. Um, so that is something I'm gonna definitely keep in mind for the future. Um, next, please. So finally, this is our YouTube page. I don't know, our, our DR had a platform update, so I have to check to see if the videos got in there, but we you know, we decided to put them in YouTube also because that's easier to share on, on social media. So it's the main presentation and then all the pre-recorded ones. Um, so I was very happy with the outcome. I learned a lot about the experience, both with hosting technology, uh, hosting, you know, technology that is available, um, lots of things, you know, I thought I prepared enough, but I did not prepare enough. And so now I'm like, you're never prepared enough. Just remember that. Um, and it wasn't bad. Everyone expects technology difficulty, I think, for the most part. Um, and just like the year before, I was worried about the students, but they did a beautiful job. They were not sweating at all. They showed up, they smiled, they answered questions, you know, they did a great job, very, you know, very, um, you know, I try to pitch this as like, if, you know, this would be like if you were at a conference. And so, you know, they really uh, did a great job. And now we have a record of their research and the library has a record of the presentation highlighting different stories from our collections. Some of them are well known, and but most of them are not. So overall, it was a good event, even though 
it made me sweat a little. And I believe Brian is next. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so my name is Brian Whitledge. Uh, I am at the Clark Historical Library where I serve as a um, uh, archivist for University Digital Records. Uh, as far as my description, I am a white male who is a week away from being 39. Uh, I have a full beard and I'm wearing a bright orange shirt in my office with a bookshelf behind me. Um, that way in that small screen, you don't have to squint. And if you really wanna know the titles, I'll even read them off for you. Uh, what Rachel was mentioning with WebEx, I will probably mention some things with WebEx because my institution is a WebEx institution. Um, and yes, it was a pain. I actually learned a lot about Adobe Premiere Pro because of uh, that video recording thing that Rachel had mentioned. So today I'm going to be talking about taking a speaker series virtual. So, um, you know, broadcasting from the studios of WARC. I hope everybody enjoys the archives pun. Uh, so a speaker series. So in the best of times, a speaker series is a great tool for outreach. Um, and I would suggest that any institution thinks about using them. And a lot of places would say, well, who can I talk to? One of the best is for about who can be a speaker is um, researchers who make use of your materials. Uh, you've talked to them in the reading room. They, they're interesting. You know that they can hold a conversation. They seem decent. Um, you could say, hey, would you mind coming back and speaking about, about this stuff? Uh, it, it does make for a great um, way of engaging your materials with an audience who may find it interesting. Uh, speakers from other conferences and programs, if you attend something and you like the way somebody is presenting, uh, uh, it's worth talking to them and asking them and giving them an invite. In Michigan, we have something called the Michigan Notable Book Award. And um, each year, the Library of Michigan puts forward people for their tour. Um, and the Library of Michigan funds the tour. The speakers don't get paid that much, about $300 honorarium. Um, but uh, they will come to your institution and, and do a talk. Um, and also sometimes, you know, if you have the fortune of having a donor who wants to see somebody who's a nationally known figure and it, it coincides with what you're doing uh, at your institution as far as research is concerned or materials, um, it's a great uh, instance. So this picture is um, Michelle Briggs from the Sioux St. Marie Locks, the Sioux Locks complex. And she was speaking about the Sioux Locks to our audience, which in Michigan does care about the Sioux Locks. Um, and just for the captioning, Sioux is S-A- ULT, it's a French thing, so yeah. Uh, as far as being outreach, why are they great? Well, first, the speaker series are um, excellent opportunity to bring audiences in. So sometimes there are people who really, they like what you have, but they have no research interest. They're avocational, but they really like it. So they like to see things. So it's a great way to bring them in and allow them to, to interact with the materials, even if they aren't really interested in research. Um, receptions following the program are great. They're usually a highlight. They can be as simple as lemonade and cookies, but as long as people are around and mingling, um, people do like to just chat. It becomes a social thing, um, we've noticed. We do about five here at the Clark Historical Library on our calendar, five a semester, and it is a social part of the calendar when we are in person. Um, it's a great opportunity for donor relations. Somebody says, I didn't realize you had that. Guess what? I have X, and they can bring it to your institution. Or um, we had one donor several years ago who said, this reception is just not very fun. And they uh, created a fund for our parties. It's the party fund. So that's kind of nice. There is some cost affiliated with it. You may have honoraria, you will have travel, you will have a reception. Um, you might have to dig in and find uh, three to $500 and maybe even more if it's a nationally known uh, speaker. Um, there is great bang for the buck though. It does have payoff. Um, if you invest in it as a form of outreach. So this is a speaker series in the best of times. So uh, March of 2020, we were all ready for our speaker to open our exhibit and all of a sudden we are told that you're not happening. So March 17th was when we were supposed to have our exhibit opening or our speaker opening our pop-up book exhibit, a nationally known pop-up book author because the Clark is a special collections as well as archives. And um, he couldn't make it, we had to cancel and everything got shut down. So we canceled the rest of our uh, spring speaker series for that year. And we started talking remotely, what are we gonna do for the fall? So we thought, well, we can throw in the towel and not do anything, or we can make lemonade out of lemons. And that speaker, Matthew Reinhardt said, well, you know, I would be interested in doing a virtual talk for you all and I'll even cut my feet. So that was great. Um, 
And so we said, okay, let's do this. Let's do virtual. Who can we get? How can we do this? And we started putting feelers out to various um, people who we thought could make for good talks, people who were scheduled for the previous spring, and also some others who we know who had done research and and could be for a good could make for a good speaker. And um, so we decided we were going to make lemonades out of lemons, and uh, and and we came up with a virtual speaker series. So how do you move your speaker series online? Uh, the first step was choosing a schedule that works out with the presenters and flexibility was fantastic. So normally for our spring, we don't start speakers until the end of February because we're in Michigan. And if we get a snow day, which we get regularly, um, that, that just doesn't work, especially Matthew Reinhardt's in, in, in uh, uh, San Francisco. That's a flight, that's, that's a lot of, of headache for us. So we're limited by a calendar. Of course, we can't go too far into April because then it's the end of the semester and we're dealing with all of those conflicts. Um, so we really only have a six week window and we're trying to coordinate it. But with uh, virtual, it's whenever the people have a free evening at home. So that was really nice uh, way to approach it. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility. So start working out the schedule. The second step was finding your technology. So we went with what our institution uses, which is WebEx. Um, if your institution uses Zoom, use Zoom. Um, if your institution uses whatever it is, use that. Or if your institution doesn't have a preference and they're kind of agnostic, use what works for you and your audience. Um, I have seen presentations broadcast on YouTube. Um, it's, it's Every tool has pluses and minuses. Every tool is difficult uh, in one way or another. Um, but use what you have access to. Um, and that takes you to the third step in the plan, which is test your technology. Um, you don't know everything that the technology can do. What Rachel mentioned is a perfect example of what we had happen with some of our recordings. Uh, the worst part was for our recordings, we had three different people logged in as panelists and we didn't have the recording set right for our first two or three. So we had three little squares and we had many talking heads uh, but there weren't video going on because the other two people were just tech help. Um, so all you'd see is the initials of the person and, and that wasn't what anybody wanted. Um, so we had to remember, okay, record only the speaker view. So you have to test your technology. The fourth step, test it again, change your settings, text, test and practice some more. The fifth step is test again, force the hiccups, create worst case scenarios, stress yourself out, use private browsing with a non-logged in account on the same computer that you're on to see if you can get it. Try to create feedback, get friends and colleagues to be test viewers, have them try to gum up the works. Just try to make as many messes as you can. Um, I don't have a step six and a step seven, but if any of you would like to guess, I'm sure that you will guess correctly. It is test and test. Uh, as Rachel said, there's bound to be mistakes. So no matter how much you test, you're going to, to have a mistake. Um, so that's a good opportunity to say, okay, let's test this in a, with, with everybody who's involved. So you contact your, um, your, your uh, speaker and you set up a time for a test drive. Uh, as I said, we're a WebEx institution. We had to explain to many speakers, WebEx is exactly like Zoom, just different. And um, most of them got the hang of it, no problem, but we can't assume that they know the video conferencing and broadcasting tool, uh, which can be problematic, um, particularly uh, if the person doesn't show up to the test drive, which we had one. Um, and then they say, well, how am I sharing? I don't know, I don't, where's this, where's that? We wanna go through all of that with the speaker ahead of time. Uh, I have heard from some colleagues that they will actually pretty much have the speaker present the entire slideshow, the slide deck, they'll do, test question and answer period. Um, we didn't go that far. We would give it 15, 20 minutes at the most, make sure people were um, familiar and felt good with the, the software. Um, we also would work out with the speaker then how they'd like to handle questions and answers. Um, we did set a setting so that we muted everybody's microphone. We didn't want microphones being unmuted. So like this webinar scenario that we're in today, uh, but we did allow chats back and forth. Sometimes you may, the speaker may not want to get the chat. So you'll say, please direct all questions to the moderator who's the host. And in this case, the moderator today, it would be, uh, you know, it would be me here. And then I would pass on the questions to our presenter. Um, we also would do uh, set up other logistics. So recording, um, we don't make our speakers sign up promise to record. Most of them are um, 
or any kind of uh, deed of gift regarding recording. We do it via email, via handshake agreement type thing because most of our speakers are are okay. I mean, when we, they're avocational historians, they're really not, there isn't any monetary gain. They're happy to share the information. They know it's promoting the institution. So a quick just agreement of, do you mind if we record this to post it on our platform and on YouTube? And they'll say, sure. Um, other logistics that need to be handled, if there's a donor that needs to be thanked, and you know that your donor doesn't want to be thanked by Brian, the host, your donor would rather be thanked by Matthew, the award-winning pop-up book artist, make sure that the donor, the, the speaker knows that they'll need to thank a donor. Um, if there's copies of books that need to be inscribed, work all those type of things out. Uh, that's what we would do. So then we, you've got this event, it's on the books, you've got a speaker, everything's set, you got to tell the world about it. So when we have the in-person events, we get a standard audience of about 30 regulars. And then depending on what the topic related to, we could get another 30 to 50 students. And if it was nationally known and we could get a, a little bit of play around the community, we could get another 30 people in. So 110 was a big audience for us. Um, with virtual, we can do all sorts. We can use social media, and with social media, it's great to mention other organizations that have potential audiences. Spread the word, right? You contact, um, if I, Matthew Reinhardt's on the screen, so I'll mention him again, the Movable Book Association. If it was the next slide that we'll see in a little bit, or if it was the Sioux Locks, we'll contact the um, US Army Corps of Engineers District Detroit District Office. They may retweet it and say, hey, listen to Michelle Briggs talk about the Sioux Locks at the Clark. It's virtual freedom, anybody. Um, Promote via email lists. This was a big one for us. We sent it to the state of Michigan's uh, library listserv for um, librarians throughout the state. It goes out to a lot of public libraries. Public libraries were so good about promoting our events on our behalf. They would put it on their Facebook pages, on their Twitters, if they thought their audiences, their constituency could be interested in it. And it was really nice um, as just a really simple one. Uh, lists for a particular field. We had a biologist who was speaking about mosquitoes and malaria. Um, we knew some biology professors here who could put it onto the biology lists for the, the for audiences that could be interested in the history of mosquitoes and malaria in Michigan. Um, and we also did a lot of direct emails to individuals. I will tell you this is extremely labor intensive. I spent uh, several hours just looking up professors at institutions, teachers at high schools, getting a direct email from a directory, sending an email saying, hey, hello, I think you'd be interested in this, please tell your students. Um, we did collect data on who our researchers were, not extensive data, but just looking at the email address at the end. And we knew for, for instance, the entomology one that I sent, we could see how many .edu's were there. And it was really great to see wisconsin.edu and minnesota.edu and purdue.edu because this was telling us, or I guess it's umn.edu and wisc, but um, but it was great to see that our direct contacts had payoff and those heads of departments and instructors were sharing it with individuals who then could attend um, the virtual talk. So uh, conducting the event, you've tested and tested, you're ready. Uh, the world's going to have a ton of other things in mind for you. It's just happening. So you got to be prepared to troubleshoot and announce pardon our technical difficulties. Uh, we'll be with you. This is a, a talk about um, the Aladdin company, which is a kit home company, and we hold their business records. Uh, at the beginning, announce your ground rules, just like Brad did before our presentation here. Announce how you'll handle the questions. And if you're recording, make sure you hit record. This is going to be, this was our downfall on at least one occasion. Um, and then it's up to the presenter and you get to sit back and relax. After the event, was a big thing. So we have these recordings, we wanna tell people about it. So um, you used your automated contact capability. If your platform had it, WebEx did, it would send out an automated email. Thanks for attending. If not, try to use a mailing list or try to get registration if you can. So you can just send out a quick mail, blind copy everybody. Hey, thanks for attending, we appreciate it. Um, check out X site for the recording. Uh, if you have a recording, upload it to whatever streaming platform works for you. Um, share the links to the recordings on social media and the lists you contacted. I was doing stats and we have found that for our recordings from this past spring, we had an audience of, I don't know how many, but let's say it averaged about um, uh, 50 logins a, 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 a session. Our recordings right now, the six of the five of them that are online, we have 700 views of them. So 
you get a lot of views if it's recorded. And counting statistics. Um, when you do statistics, remember that a login isn't a viewer, so it's not the same as a backside in the seat in the auditorium. So the Clark, we, we surveyed a town attendees, we found that we had 1.4 viewers per login, which is really nice to say, okay, 50 people were here, but we know that there are 50 logins we're in, we know that's 70 people. It helps you promote what you're doing. And so that, in a very quick summary, is how we do uh, moving, went to a virtual speaker series from our uh, in-person speaker series. And I will now turn it over to our colleagues at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Thanks, Brian. I'm Tracy Robison and I'm the outreach archivist at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, I am a white woman with glasses and dark hair and a yellow sweater. And my background is the, um, it's a historic photo of the steam tunnels under Love Library. And I'll just let Katie jump in and introduce herself as well. Hello, I'm Katie Jones and I am the archive specialist at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and I am a white woman with medium long auburn hair, wearing glasses and a blue dress and then my background is a photo of cows from inside the UNL cattle barn from the 1920s. At the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Archives and Special Collections, our focus shifted to digital exhibits and promoting online resources through social media last year. And I'll be discussing how planning for an exhibits internship incorporated the need to work off site and draw from previously digitized materials. And Katie will describe her experience researching an exhibit on the 1918 pandemic and how we've used Twitter to connect with users and promote our collections. In a typical year, we curate two to three physical exhibits in archives and special collections. In 2020, our focus shift shifted entirely to digital exhibits. In addition to creating new content, we updated existing online exhibits that were about a decade old. Our new exhibits were timely, relating to women's suffrage with the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and to the flu pandemic of 1918. 2020 was also the first year for a new exhibits-focused internship. And so I'll touch upon some of the challenge we faced in the uni unique environment of shutdown and offsite work, and I'll focus on how the internship structure and operation dealt with those challenges. So the last day I was on campus in March 2020 was the final day of interviewing internship candidates. As we were hiring, we didn't know what June the position start date would look like and whether the internship would be conducted on or off site. Um, beyond the pandemic framework, uh, there were so many other elements of newness. I was in my first year as outreach archivist, a new faculty member in a newly created position. I hadn't overseen an internship before. The internship was new with no existing structure to draw from. The intern would be new and the experience of working offsite was all new too. Lack of access to physical collections was another challenge. From March to July, only specified essential workers could report to campus. We had no access to collections during planning for the internship or ultimately during the intern's work. The internship's duration was nine weeks during June and July, and in that time the intern would need to be trained, research an exhibit, select representative items to include, write exhibit text, and design the exhibition. That's a lot to do in such a short time period. Next slide, please. So planning and preparation were key in meeting the challenges. Early on, I decided to plan within the scenario of working offsite and relying on previously digitized resources. I created a nine week schedule for the internship with specific tasks, learning objectives and targeted deadlines for the exhibit work. My intention was to provide structure and guidance that would support the intern in a step-by-step -step progression toward a successful project. And just as important as the final project, the internship was meant to provide the intern with the experience and skills that she could build on in her ongoing career. The first week focused on training with daily learning objectives and tasks. Topics covered included introduction to archives, how to use a finding aid, primary source analysis, using WordPress, introduction to universal design and accessibility, 
and using the web accessibility evaluation tool WAVE. Training on exhibit creation involved understanding the difference between digital exhibits and digital collections, theme development, planning, research, item selection, and writing exhibit copy. I provided the intern with related readings, examples of online exhibits, and prompts to think critically about them. After the first week, the schedule had weekly rather than daily objectives and tasks. For example, week two's objective was exhibit proposal with a deadline on that Friday for having written a brief description of the exhibit's theme and objectives. Week three focused on analyzing the exhibit proposal and the end of the week deadline called for an outline of the exhibit's key ideas. Understanding the eight weeks essentially of creating an exhibit from start to finish is a very short timeline. I provided some groundwork that I thought of as exhibit seeds. Rather than beginning with endless possibilities for a topic, I assigned the broad topic of women's suffrage with a few parameters, which were first a connection to our archives and uh, collections and university history. Um, for example, incorporating student experiences related to the suffrage movement, or the involvement of faculty and staff for or against suffrage, basically focusing on the unique story or stories that could be told about the intersection of women's voting rights in the university. The second parameter was that the exhibit should include a timeline with important dates related to women's suffrage, highlighting events significant to Nebraska or the university. Third, research would include the use of primary sources from our collections. Supplementation from other cited primary and secondary sources to support the theme was fine. To further help with the time crunch, I identified and provided relevant secondary sources so the intern could begin immediately gaining background knowledge about the exhibit's general topic. I also identified a range of digitized items and digital resources the intern could draw from during the ongoing research and curation. And all this was provided in materials uh, from the week one orientation. The intern's work itself involved a combination of updating the older exhibits on WordPress and um, the site she'd be using for her new exhibits and working toward the creation of the new exhibit on WordPress. So working with the old exhibit on WordPress began during the first week, providing a hands-on way to practice using the site. As well as building up familiarity with the platform, this combination gave her alternative work to break up training and later on to shift focus from research and writing. So it provided a bit of an easy win when uh, research hit walls or writer's block set in. Communication was key throughout the internship. Uh, daily Zoom meetings at the beginning of each shift allowed the intern and I to brainstorm, talk through challenges she was facing, uh, touch base on her progress and just connect. Uh, next slide, please. So what were the final outcomes? The intern Alexis Thomas created the online exhibit Votes for Women Student Perfect <laughs> Perspectives, which informs visitors about the suffrage movement in Nebraska, student support or opposition to it, and the suffrage work and continued political involvement of some of the student suffragists. Alexis also updated the exhibit, Great Posters of the Great War. Uploading and laying out digital content and text on the new exhibit site, providing alt text descriptions for each of the site's images and testing the exhibit using WAVE. She was successful in her work. To assess my own work and designing the internship, it was important to understand what learning outcomes Alexis had gained from the experience. Among the learning outcomes reported were improvements in time management, research and critical thinking and analysis of information and writing, as well as experience working independently. Next slide, please. During shutdown, I reached out to my colleagues to see if they were interested in creating exhibits for the new site. At the beginning of the pandemic, in particular, reference questions related to the 1918 flu pandemic were pouring in, and it was a timely topic for digital exhibitions. Assistant archivist Pete Brink, our resident Husker sports expert, created an exhibit about the pandemic's impact on the 1918 football season. And now I'll pass things off to Katie, who will talk about researching her own exhibit on the 1918 pandemic, as well as how we've used Twitter to stay connected and promote our resources. All right, thanks, Tracy. 
So I'll talk a little bit about my unique experience of working on a pandemic exhibit during a pandemic. So as Tracy mentioned, we had a lot of reference interest on the 1918 flu on campus. And because we had the advantage of getting to focus on a research project while we were off site, we decided to create two exhibits. Our colleague Pete Brink's exhibit focused on the 1918 Cornhusker football season. And then my exhibit focused on campus as a whole during the flu pandemic. So one thing that we found interesting is when Pete and I pr presented our flu exhibits at an academic brown bag on campus, we found that people were really interested in the topic. But most importantly, we found that our research provided some historical context for discussion on how students and staff may have experienced a pandemic in 1918 versus how we're experiencing it now. And I think that provided some really interesting perspective. But also one thing that really surprised me when researching the flu on campus is how we really don't have any personal firsthand accounts of what campus was really like in 1918. We only, have the, we only have how the flu was reported through the lens of the chancellor's records, the university newspapers and the yearbooks, and a few tiny mentions in scrapbooks. And I think this is really important to point out because of our current focus in the archives community of collecting COVID-19 stories, which we are also trying to collect. Um, we can pick up the bits and pieces of the experience, but if someone says, and someone's, but if someone, say like a 1918 librarian, was able to collect these stories in 1918, the exhibit, our discussion, and the story could have been entirely different. We can't just assume these stories will survive and be findable in the future on their own. And of course, history often repeats itself, so you'll never know when the historical context of your community's history will be important in the future. Next slide. So now that we've talked a little bit about our exciting new exhibits, let's switch gears a bit to talk about how we promote our exhibits and our collections at UNL. We use Twitter as an outreach tool for promotion, but also as a way to interact with our community and to keep up with other archives and museums. And this con connection seemed really vital during a time when we were closed and weren't physically interacting with our patrons. And I'll explain some of the fun ways we do that. So the first way we encourage interaction is through themed hashtag days. So we always love to participate in the National Archives, Archives hashtag party, which if you are unfamiliar, is a monthly social media theme on Twitter. And the National Archives provides a theme, like May's theme was Archives Bugs, and it's a community event to post highlights from your collections. But we also love to participate in Archives 30, which is lesser known, and it's from the Archives and Records Association of Scotland, and we participate every year. This is a similar concept, concept to the archives hashtags party, but instead it's a daily theme for all 30 days of April. So some of this year's themes included archives goals, untold stories, archives hacks, and archival misconceptions. And we love participating in these because it's an, always a fun challenge to think of things to fit the theme, but also we just enjoy interacting with other archives from around the world that don't always appear in our feed. And I find that Archives 30 and Hashtag Party often get more engagement from the archives and museum communities rather than our local community, but I still find it really enlightening because it really heightens our sense of community within Archives Twitter itself. And it's always fun to see what everyone is working on. And we also really loved theme hashtag days because it's a great way to give a more behind the scenes approach to our collections and to showcase all the weird cool stuff we have, as well as current projects we are working on. Next slide. So, we, we like following theme days, but we also create our own homegrown themes and hashtags. These tend to change over time and to reflect what we're working on or what our patrons or students are researching. And sometimes they get engagement and sometimes they don't. So one of our hashtag themes uh, that we're currently doing is the DN Daily or the Daily Nebraskan, which is our university newspaper. And since our newspapers are digitized and available online, the DN Daily is our version of this on this day in history for campus history. So these tweets are done by our students and are a simple and fun way to interact with campus. We found that people often recognize themselves or maybe an event they attended or a professor they had, and it can sometimes spark discussion. And we also try to tag related departments on campus uh, or our alumni association. And we try to do this in a lot of our tweets because it encourages interactions, but it also keeps us a little bit more accessible. It keeps us in people's mind um, of the types of things we might collect if they're cleaning out their office, or maybe they think of us as a resource to answer a question they might have. Next slide. So that leads to my personal favorite hashtag, and that is Moose Day. Oops. 
yep, there we go. Uh, on Tuesdays, aka Moose Days, we post pictures of cows and also terrible cow jokes. And you might be asking why? Well, first, Nebraska is a cattle state. We're a land grant university and we have a strong ag and animal science programs, but also we have just some, some amazing historical photographs collections that support these programs. And also we just think cows are really cool. And we try to use our, our collection strength to our advantage on Twitter. And another example of this is Tractor Tuesday, which we've done in the past. It's a, um, it, we're unique in that we have the Larson Tractor Test and Power Museum on campus, which documents the history of the Tractor Test Lab, um, which is internationally known for its power and performance testing on ag equipment. And we are the repository for their records. So we have a lot of people who love tractors and cows in, in our community and agriculture. So why not tweet about it? Next slide. So I saved the best hashtag theme for last. And so let me introduce you to Corn Cob Man. So Corn Cob Man was UNL's first on-field mascot from 1955 to the early 1960s. And some would say the most terrifying. Next slide. We've kind of adopted Corn Cob Man as our unofficial mascot of the UNL archives. And that's because in 2019, we celebrated UNL's 150th anniversary, and we wanted to do something special for homecoming. So Tracy and I decided we'd have our own celebration by introducing Corn Cob Man back into the wild. So how did we do that? Well, we did a lot of work badly photoshopping him and asking other people to badly photoshop him into campus or into other moments of campus history or world history. And although we can't be sure that Corn Cob Man wasn't at the signing of the US Constitution, we did try to emphasize that we wanted badly photoshopped photos because one, it's more entertaining. But two, we didn't wanna rewrite history and want people to be confused that these photos were real. Next slide. And then here's a few examples of some of the interactions we've had from campus. Um, because we, because UNL has such a rich football history, Corn Cob Man is an easy and approachable way to catch people's eyes and get people interested in our collections. And we use them as an icebreaker because we've discovered that people often have a memory or a story of a weird mascot they grew up with. And it gets people interested in our sports collections. And it kind of just brings back nostalgia from their time at UNL or a football game they attended. And it starts discussion. And since he's the unofficial mascot of the, of the archives, we try to bring him into an event or really anything. Sometimes he pops up in coworkers' office and he's pretty unforgettable. So here's our challenge to you. Uh, we challenge all of you, to, all of you to find the creepiest mascot in the history of your organization and tweet them at us uh, because I would like to see them and because you'd be surprised how easy they act as icebreakers or stories of fondness uh, that people have of them. Next slide. So in conclusion, these are just a few of the themes we've done um, that we started or continued throughout the pandemic. And my advice to you is to always use the collection strings to your advantage on social media, even if it isn't exciting like agriculture and tractors. And it's okay if you don't have a lot of followers or can't devote much staff time to social media. We don't have that many followers either, but we just try to be consistent and send out things that people can interact with. And uh, they seem to enjoy it. And if your organization has some cool hashtags, please tweet them at us. We'd love to participate. And also, if you have cool historical cow photos, send them to me because it will bring me an incredible amount of joy. And lastly, if you happen to be on Twitter and want to follow us so we can get more followers than History Nebraska, which is our state historical society and also our neighbor, that would be okay too. And then just a quick acknowledgement to our students, Alexis Thomas, Petra Hiles, and Pete Brink for all of their hard work on social media and exhibits. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we will now open the floor for questions. Again, please use the Q&A feature so we can be sure that we see it and direct it to the appropriate people. All right, uh, question has come in uh, to K for Katie. Do you have a sense of which social media posts are more likely to engage users than others? So I would say not really. We often just kind of post things that we're working on or like are in the news or people are talking about on campus. Um, but there are things like football that always do well in engagement. Even though I'm not a sports fan, I always try to post about sports because we're a big sports school. And so just kind of 
posting things that people are currently talking about and are interested in. And also if you just kind of post things enough, like cows, people just learn to like it and enjoy it. All right, uh, we've got about two minutes for two more minutes for questions. So, um, if you have anything else that you'd like to ask, now is the time. Otherwise, in the meantime, while I'm waiting for the last ones to go in, I do want to remind people not uh, to don't not to forget to check out our virtual posters and tours during your downtime. I the link to those I am going to uh, paste in to the chat box. And please also remember to fill out the evaluations uh, when it arrives via email next week. That helps Mac do a better conference like this in the future. All right, um, question from, I guess for all the panelists, would you say you had more participants or viewers of virtual programs than you would have had an equivalent in person? This is Rachel and yes. This is Brian and it's it's a trade-off. We had um, we had regulars who showed up all the time for the social aspect and, and now we have people who are maybe more engaged in the thing. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, if you've noticed everything that we do, we often hear how people say, oh, people don't respect the work that archivists do. People don't respect what archivists do. People don't know what archivists do. Um, what all of us talked about are our ways of uh, making sure that people know what archivists do. We make our work meaningful to them. And as much as Katie's uh, examples are fun and goofy um, or, or, or whatnot, it, it is how we bring people in to understand what we do and make what we do meaningful and make them value us in a way that maybe they support our organizations, whether it's, you know, at the ballot box or with donations or, or whatnot. So. Um, All right. We are unfortunately out of time. Um, so uh, if you have any additional questions, there is the contact information. Um, and thank you to all the speakers for their uh, extremely valuable perspectives on dealing with outreach. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.